So for the past eight or so weeks, I have been preaching to a mostly empty building. And that's not nearly as exciting. <laughs> and we created those online experiences that you've had. And I know that's been helpful and important. And I know that God's word will go out and not return void. And I'm grateful for those tools and the technology that enables us to do that. Today there will be many that get join us uh, through some of those technologies, and that is perfectly fine. I'm glad that we can minister to people through those means, and we will continue to do that as long as it's beneficial. And everybody that is going to be watching on video or Facebook Live today is an equally important member of this congregation. I know too that we can worship God wherever we are. God is not limited to the spaces that we puny humans set aside for worship. You can and you have worship God in your living room and on your walks in the countryside and driving in your car and that's all good. I know, too, that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, God is present. Our worship is not defined by the size of the crowd or whether or not you have a preacher present. God is not hindered by time or space or distance or atmosphere, and we have proven that we can worship God, our worship of God will not be stopped or restrained or diminished by a coronavirus. Amen? Amen? All that said, it's good to be here. It is good to be here. This feels right. To gather with our community. To, to be with our like-minded Friends who love the Lord and profess Jesus Christ as their Savior, live and in person, together it enables our worship, it amplifies our worship, it reinforces our faith, it validates and strengthens and it gives us the ability to worship more powerfully, more passionately. Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. We're going to be in the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the story of rebuilding the city of Jerusalem following the Babylonian captivity. At that time, worship had been neglected and overlooked, not because of sickness, but because of politics. And no, I'm not going there. The people of Israel had uh, been away from their spiritual home for a couple of generations. And then when they finally got back to Jerusalem, they had to rebuild the city. They rebuilt the city walls. And worship had been overlooked. But the day came, and the time came, and the people came, and they gathered in a place, and they worshipped the Lord their God together. Nehemiah chapter 8. Beginning at verse 1, would you stand, please, that we would honor the reading of God's word. <clears throat> now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Father God, May our ears be attentive to your word this day, and may you be magnified through it. May you be glorified, and may we experience you in a life-changing sort of way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Be seated, please. Nehemiah is a fascinating book, and there's a lot of great lessons in it. 
It's directly and mostly about the building of these city walls, but I find it most inspiring as an extended metaphor for the rebuilding, not of walls, but of lives. Rebuilding us. Rebuilding people. You see, when we find Jesus, that rebuilding goes on in us, and we are renewed, and we are refreshed, and we have a new sense of hope and healing and wholeness in the soul. And when that happens, we have a response to it. When that happens in us, we are drawn to worship. We are humbled by it all, and we honor our Lord, and we give God the glory. The folks at Jerusalem, when the city was strengthened, they worship God. For us, when our lives and our faith is strengthened, we worship God. And we humble ourselves before him. Jesus talked about a significant life of worship. And he defined it and he expressed it in how we love God. And there's a great and passionate story in Mark chapter 12. Jesus said that our love for God and our worship of God is a reflection of the whole self. The total person. And it requires something from every Part of us. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And there's no other commandment greater than these. How we worship is a reflection of all that we are. And as I prayed and pondered and set this message up, I see the connection between what's going on in Nehemiah 8 and these words of Jesus in Mark chapter 12. As we are being built and rebuilt personally, as we build and rebuild our congregation after the time of hiatus, there are some things that we need to see and identify as we mark our path forward. And we know that we're building, we know that we're being rebuilt in the right way and for the right reasons when we end up with hearts that hunger for worship. You shall love the Lord with all your heart. And we see that happening in Nehemiah chapter 8. Their hearts were longing for God. And we meet Ezra. Ezra was a priest a scribe, a scholar, and a teacher of God's word. Nehemiah was kind of the construction foreman. Ezra was the chaplain for the project. Ezra, in his own book, Ezra had prepared in his heart to seek the law of God and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. And the whole city gathered at the Watergate Square for the worship service. Verse 8, or sorry, verse 3 says, He read from the book, he read from the book of the law from early morning until midday. The presence of the men, the women, all who can understand. Early morning to midday. Three, four, five, six hours. We should try that here, you think? Four or five hour worship service. I know that after about 40 minutes of me yapping, I see eyelids start to droop. I see people checking their watch. I do my best to keep it interesting, folks. But these folks had hungry hearts. And they were attentive to the book of the law. And they focused on it. And they were unified in their heart and in their spirit. And in fact, we see those two indicators of that hunger in their heart First, with unity. Verse 1 says, they gathered as one man. They were unified. They were all together. Whatever their likes and dislikes, whatever issues they had between one another, they all had one thing in common. A hunger for the Lord. And the rich and the poor were there. And the people who lived inside the city walls and the people who lived in the countryside were there. And on the other side of the tracks too. And they were welcome. No class division. No political divides. Just people 
wanting to hear what God has to say. They were unified. I think every preacher dreams about that day when people will get unified under the word of God. People whose hearts are hungry to hear from the Lord. They set aside their differences. They set aside their issues. They set aside their own comforts. They're on the edge of their seat to hear and experience the truth of God. So they were unified and they were focused. They were attentive to the book of the law. Zeroed in on it. No mention here of the labor of building a wall. No conversation about their obstacles and challenges that they'd faced. Not worried about where they were going to go to lunch after the service. No worries or about circumstances or differences of opinion or who's playing football that afternoon. All those things didn't matter. The one thing mattered. Hearing a word from God and humbling themselves before him. There's an expectation. There is an anticipation. There is a desire to hear. And the crowd was ready to learn. And it was not an entertainment hour. And they didn't have PowerPoints and fancy lighting and a smoke machine. They were serious. They were attentive. And they looked forward to what God had to say. They craved God's word the way hungry people crave a sandwich. Because of our time out in gathering, because of our hiatus, this long pause we've had to endure, I think there's a, there's a hunger among us today. We are hungry to hear. That's a desire to know, a desire to be with God's people, to be in the house of the Lord. I challenge you, my friends, let's hold on to that sense of hunger. Let's, let's cultivate that desire for God. Let's ask God to take his initiative in us to give us a deep longing for spiritual truth. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to work on us, to draw us closer, to give us that deep interest in God, to have that desire and anticipation to know Him and to serve Him and to honor Him and to understand His truth that we would be changed. That, my friends, is our worship. That we are drawn to God. That we are overwhelmed by his goodness and that we have a longing for him, a hunger in our heart and that we should never take it lightly or never take it for granted or sit and daydream about other lesser things or let the worries of the world hinder us or prevent us or stop us. Hungry, united, focused. You know you've built and rebuilt in the right way and for the right reasons when you have hearts that hunger and you also have strength on display. Mark 12 again, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And that of course speaks to our physical selves. The, how we use our bodies, how we use our, the, the physical realm as elements of our worship. And I see in these couple of verses about seven different ways they expressed worship in the physical self. The body language of worship, you might say. In verse 4 and 5, it starts with buildings and facilities. And Ezra stood on a wooden platform which they had made for the purpose. It was intentional. It was deliberate. And Ezra and his team were there so that the people could see clearly. And it wasn't just thrown together haphazard. It was planned and prepared for this very occasion. We too have a wonderful facility. And it gets prepared for the occasion. And we have to maintain it and take care of it and pay for it and all those things. 
And that takes time and effort and energy and it takes financial resources. And that too is part of our worship as we give gifts and offerings. They worship with buildings and facilities. They worship with their eyes. They saw Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people that he was standing in front of. And you know that most often when I preach, I have this book in my hand. And I carry it with me. And I refer to it. And I read from it. And I rely on it. I have notes. I don't carry my notes around. I carry the book around. I refer to my notes. My notes guide me. But the book is what inspires me. And the book is my, is my authority. And the book is where the power is. And simply by carrying it with me, the unspoken message to you is, rely on the book. Rely on the book. Don't trust in the wisdom of man. Rely on the book. Amen? And they saw Ezra relying on the book. They worship God by standing. In verse 5. All the people stood as he opened the book. And at the beginning of the passage, during a sermon, I invite you to stand that we would honor the reading of God's word. And we do that because of this. We do that to honor the author of the word. When you are in court and the judge comes in, you hear that, all rise. When the commanding general comes into the room, all the soldiers get on their feet and stand to attention. When you meet the Queen of England, you're probably not going to be sitting down, are you? We stand to honor those people that are important to us. Surely... We shall stand to honor the Lord. Go on to verse 6. They worship God by blessing God. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. The body language of worship includes the words we speak. Includes the actions we take. So often in our prayer life, we ask God, oh, bless me, God. Bless my friend who's sick, God. Bless us, God. How about you being a blessing to God? How about you blessing God in the, in the words you speak? How about you blessing God through your uh, words of praise, through your actions of service? Doing it. i got to get my microphone set before this next bit because it's important. <clears throat> Part of the body language of worship is agreeing. Verse 6, all the people answered, amen, amen. All the people answered and they said they verbalized the word amen. And amen means yes, and may it be so. And amen means, as Jesus said in the King James English, verily I say unto you, that's an amen moment. It's a word of affirmation. It's a word of agreement. It's a word of solidarity with the spoken word. The leader leads in worship, and as I speak here and give a monologue, it's my thoughts and my impressions and my ideas and my devotion. When you say amen, you are joining in on that, and it becomes a mutual thing. It becomes a cooperative thing. That's an amen kind of moment. I was hoping you'd just catch right on that. Amen! Amen! Part of the body language of worship includes the lifting of hands. All the people lifted their hands before God. Here in our church, we got some hand-waving Baptists, and I'm good with that. 
That's fine. That's great. We got some folks that are not hand wavers, and I'm good with that too. Because you got to do it the way it comes naturally to you. And you got to do it how the Lord leads you. And you got to do what feels right to you. And the only guidance I have about being a hand-waving Baptist or a not hand-waving Baptist is don't be ashamed or influenced by the opinions of men. You do you. You worship God in the way it makes sense to you. If you want to go like this during the song, rock on. And if you want to sit quietly with your head bound, rock on. It's all okay. Just do what's between you and God. Verse 6 continues on. They worship God by bowing. They bowed low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Seeking God's face sometimes means hiding our own. Covering our own. And humbling the self. And honoring God in our posture by lowering oneself to the ground. It expresses humility and expresses devotion and honor. And the simple bowing of our heads says, God, you are great and I am not. And you must increase and I must decrease. Body language of worship. Whatever the people in Jerusalem were doing that day, they were not casual spectators. They participated physically with the strength God gave them. Rebuilding the right way and for the right reasons, hearts that hunger and strength on display and minds that learn. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind. In your mind. They devoted their minds to learning the word of God. And that's what verse 7 and 8 talks about. When Ezra was on the platform, he had some assistants with him. He had a bunch of folks that were teaming with him to help the people understand more clearly. Verse 8 says, they gave the sense. They helped people understand the sense of the words. They unlocked the door that leads to greater understanding, more clearly and more powerfully. They gave the people the in-depth meaning with all its implications. So that understanding and enlightenment and the aha moments would occur. This is what it says. And here's some things that it means. And here's some ideas for how we can live those things out in our daily routine life. This episode happened in the 7th century before Christ. 2,700-ish years ago. And here we are today. This is what it says. This is what it means. And here's some ways we can live it out in our daily lives. Worship of God by submitting ourselves and learning about His Word. And any teacher or preacher that gets up and says, well, uh, thus saith the Lord, wants to see people apply the word to their lives, submit to the authority of the word of God, and let let it be the guide for living day by day. Let us have great understanding so we can apply these words to ourselves and to our lives and so honor God as we live for him. I am grateful for minds that learn. I am grateful for those who take on the role of teacher to enable the learning of others, to assist, to coach, to encourage. I am grateful for the willingness that this congregation has to submit their hearts and minds and lives under the authority of God's word and let Scripture be 
our absolute final authority and guide. Rebuilding the right way and for the right reasons. Our lives, our church, our community, hearts that hunger, strength on display, minds that learn, and souls that respond. You should love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Soul. In verse 10 of Nehemiah, there was a lot of emotion going on. These people demonstrated their love for God from the depth of their soul. They were moved in the spirit because of the power of their worship. You see, worship changes us. Worship does some things in us, and it moves us. Real worship and true worship afflicts those who are comfortable. Why do you suppose they were crying that day? They were crying perhaps because they recognized their own guilt before God their own inadequacy before God. They were thinking about all those years they had lived ignoring the principles of God when they neglected the word of God. They were convicted of their sin and their own brokenness before the Lord and they experienced the guilt that comes from it. God's word exposes sin. And sometimes that's painful for us. And the people there, they recognize that. And they all recognize their guilt because everybody was guilty in some way. They had all fallen short of the glory of God. They had all, like sheep, gone astray and they recognized it. And sometimes, my friends, when when God's people gather together, And the spirit moves among us. And the emotions run high. And sometimes there is a brokenness and a humility that leaks out of our eyes. And that's okay. And when we're serious about God and we're serious about his word, when we're serious about sin and restoration, and we are no longer going to be casual or haphazard in our faith, earnestly desiring to know and experience the power of God that will move our emotions, that will move in our soul. And we express those in, in all kinds of unique ways. Real worship afflicts the comfortable, but real worship also comforts the afflicted. Comforts the afflicted. And the the teachers in Ezra said, hey, stop your crying. Go your way and celebrate. Yes, you've sinned. Yes, you're guilty, but our God is a God of mercy and grace and restoration. Celebrate. Don't cry, don't weep. Praise, recognize the God of all joy. He is a Lord of forgiveness and grace and healing. So have a party. And make sure the poor people in your neighborhood have enough to have a party too. Think about the others around you. They were weeping out of grief and they were weeping out of gladness all together. They had lived for a long time in a way that had displeased God. And they were glad and they had joy that instead of rejecting them, God's forgiveness welcomes them and brings them back. And they'd sent Nehemiah to restore the city and Ezra to restore their hearts. And they were returning to their spiritual home. And they found that wholeness and that peace and that grace once again. And the grief looked back and the joy looked ahead. And there's joy in the Lord. And He is our strength. Our joy is not found in the circumstances of what happens or what doesn't happen. Our joy is not found by how 
difficult the world is and how we overcome it. It has nothing to do with feeling good or healthy or wealthy or wise. Our joy is found in the goodness of God. And we worship Him and we honor Him. Our joy comes in the knowledge of His healing and His wholeness of who God is and what He does and how He restores us. Our joy is found in abiding in Him. We experience all those things in our worship. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. May your worship be enabled and restored today. And may we, as we go about this long and arduous process of rebuilding after this strange period, may worship be a central feature for this congregation and each one of your lives. Amen? Amen. Father God, we rejoice. We thank you for the privilege of worship. We thank you that you're at work in the midst of us. We thank you, Lord, that your mercy and grace is so very restorative and that you have great plans for your people and for your church. And we pray, God, that we would be responsive to you through our worship. And we pray, Lord, that you would guide us in all that we do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to close our time together, as we always do with a hymn of invitation. And the altar will be open for prayer. And I'm happy to pray with you about whatever is on your heart and mind today. I sense this renewal. I sense this rebuilding. I sense this recommitment of ourselves before the Lord God. And it's a joy and it's a blessing. Let's stand together and if you have a burden, I'm happy to pray with you about it.